I'd like to welcome everybody who is grateful enough to join us uh, this this evening and for those that are watching virtually. I hope everybody is, is doing well. Um, and as we get ready uh, to study, we will continue um, in the subject matter of stewardship matters that we've studied uh, throughout the month of July. And it is bringing us to its conclusion um, uh, tonight. Um, you know, I am one um, that believes that in, in 1 John 2 and verse 6, it states that whoever says he abides in him um, ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. And we're talking about Christ. And talking about the stewardship matters, um, and, and, and I'm one uh, from a practical standpoint um, that we should be living out in accordance with what we uh, believe. We'll, and we'll get there uh, uh, tonight. Um, uh, for the first three weeks, Pastor Scott uh, taught uh, about the parable of the talents in Matthew 25. And uh, in his second lesson, he talked about um, uh, the principles of stewardship in Psalms 24. And uh, the third week, um, uh, Pastor Scott talked about the life of stewardship in Psalms 1 and in Psalms and, and, and as I was looking at that one, you know, Pastor Scott stated that when we think of stewardship, our perspective should be that our cup runneth over. Uh, uh, he stated that stewardship encompasses all of life. Uh, if you remember, for those that have been with us, uh, he, he, he talked about uh, uh, that life goes in one of three directions. And, and I don't know if you remember those. He talked about uh, there's retrogression, which means the uh, the strain of going backwards. Uh, Pastor Scott talked about the progression, which means that it's good, but not all that God simply intends for us. And he also talked about the productive. God wants us to be productive. And, and he also made a statement um, uh, that I think that when we leave here tonight, we, we, we need to have this in mind, or for those that are watching, um, when we get done tonight, that, you know, this probably needs to stick with you a little bit, or you may, something to marinate on is that our motivation plays on how we are as being good stewards. Listen to that again. Our motivation plays on how we are as being good stewards. Most people, not all people. Because all people, you know, most, you know, some people is just, I'm going to do what I know I'm supposed to do because the word tells me to do that. But some people are motivated by, well, if I think that it can benefit me, then it says to do that. So by a byproduct, then I'll do it. Or I'll be a good steward this month, this month or next month uh, because I got a little surprise here and there, which I wasn't expecting, so I got a little bit of overflow, so I'm not going to give you what I should do, but I'm going to pinch you a little bit more over here, or it doesn't necessarily have to be money. It can be service. It can be time. It could be, you know, other things when we talk about stewardship. R.C. Sproul states that the worst sin against stewardship is to waste, is to waste, um, uh, the worst sin against stewardship is to waste your life. Uh, as we get ready tonight um, to talk about stewardship, the biblical concept of stewardship began with Adam and Eve and developed more fully in the New Testament um, is that God is owner and provider of all that any of us possess. Again, God is owner and provider of all that any of us possess. Since all belongs to him, it is incumbent that all be used for his purpose and his glory. Nobody came up on the come up by themselves. All right? Uh, you know, it, so I didn't get up this morning by Malcolm Williams. Malcolm Williams didn't get me here. I may work 40 hours a week and get a check, but somebody 
that then God put me in a position to be in that place. So we have to take this concept that all, uh, that God is owner and provider of all and that any of us, and, and that any of us possess, since all belongs to him, it is incumbent that all be used for his purpose and glory. A collective responsibility was given to mankind to have dominion over the earth. Remember that? Genesis, right? We didn't need dominion and control, right? Uh, care for it and manage it for his glory. Uh, individually, whether financial resources, real property, other valuable items, time, influence, or opportunity, the believer is to seek the mind and will of God in everything that he does. Now, uh, uh, God not only expects that we return a portion of what he gives us as tithes and offerings, but the Lord expects for all that we have to be used in ways which pleases and honors him. So we've been talking about stewardship for the past month. And so what is stewardship? Stewardship can be defined as the careful use, control, and management of the possessions of another that have been entrusted to one. We were entrusted to one. Stewardship can be defined as the careful use, control, and management of the possessions of another that have been entrusted to one. definition. I'll say it again. The careful use, control, and management of the possessions of another that have been entrusted to one. With me being a law enforcement officer, there's a crime that's called embezzlement in which the embezzler has permission to handle the property in a certain way and not to take it. Instead, the wrongdoer uses the possession of trust granted by the owner to convert the property to the embezzler's possession and to control it. In other words, stewardship, the careful use, control, and management of the possessions of another that have been entrusted to one. And if you're committed of a fraud, an embezzlement, a company has given you, have, have, have entrusted you into, if, if that money, if that property, or whatever it may be, that then you have used wrongdoing. And I say that, in essence, to say, let's not be a fraud with God. It's been entrusted with you, right? You know, you go look it up for yourself, embezzlement. Definition. I thought we was met that that's law enforcement officer and me coming here to talk. So let's not be a fraud with the gospel. He's given it to you. He's given it to you to share, not to take for yourself and use it however you may use it. I want to use it for when I think it may benefit me. But let's be obedient to what he has told us to do. So we've talked about the definition of um, stewardship. We talked about this embezzlement that was out there for us about not being a fraud. So therefore tonight, what I want to talk to you about tonight is is that the manager of Jeff Beard? I know, thank you, Mr. Cooper. Okay, all right, it is? All right, okay, so uh, all right, don't laugh at me. What I want to talk about tonight is the what is the image of stewardship? Reverend Davis, if you're watching, don't send anything uh, about me. What is the image of stewardship? So, what does stewardship should look like? Huh? So, we, we've been talking the past three weeks about the, the parable of the talents in Matthew 25. We've talk, taught on the principles of stewardship. We've talked about the life of stewardship. But in essence, that when we read the Bible, when we talk, uh, when we share, ultimately, what does that image look like? And are we walking out what that image should look like? 
So in order now, tonight we're talking about stewardship. We understand that stewardship is the careful use, control, and management of the possessions of another that have been entrusted to one. So what should that look like in our life? And if you want to see what an image looks like, normally you go look at something as to, hey, that's what I want to be like. That's what I, if I'm building a house, I want my house to be a spitting image of that. I want my car to be a spitting image of this. But when it comes to stewardship in our life, and when that, it's just not always talking about money, what does that look like in us? Huh? So if we want to know what that looks like, then we go no further than scripture. And it's not just going to be one scripture here because we're going to hit a bunch of scriptures throughout tonight. I promise I'm not, I don't want to keep you very long because I don't want nobody mad because I haven't eaten while I had a piece of chicken and that's it. Uh, <laughs> before I got and I understand folks at home will probably kick back with a pork chop sandwich which sounds good. Uh, I would like one. It's good and uh, or eating but I, I don't in, intend to stay long but what does that image look like? Alright? So if we're going to talk about what does that image look like? As an individual, what does that image look like? In multiple scriptures, in, in, in the Bible, we talk about uh, individuals acting as stewards. Uh, um, what did God, uh, uh, Adam in the garden, what did God tell Adam? Huh? The Lord, God took man, put him in the garden of Eden and to work it and take care of it. He was entrusted to it, right? Uh, uh, Joseph in Potiphar's house. Uh, uh, what did that look like? He was put over something. He worked diligently and rose himself up because he was a good steward of what had been entrusted to him. And then you look no further than on down to the Hebrew boys, as George that was taken into exile. You talk about Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when they were taken into exile. And you look at Daniel, and they were entrusted in rose in power because they were good stewards of what the Lord had given them, giving you good responsibility. No different than if we wanted to make the connection that if you're at work and someone gives you a job to do, and if you are doing it to the best of your ability, you've shown to be faithful uh, or they've entrusted something to you and you've taken really good care of it, Normally, it may help you as far as rise in position and status as far as where you're at. And, and even if it doesn't, you still should do the best that you can. That you still should be doing your best because we all know that whatever you do, you should be doing it as you're doing it for the Lord. Right? That's not Malcolm Williams. That's scripture. Whatever you do, do it as you're doing it for the Lord. So. We have examples of individuals acting as good stewards. Adam in the garden, Joseph in Potiphar's house, Daniel as the administrator in Babylon. Okay, so we see that as individuals, okay, so we can use that as examples. But when we talk about a collective group, what does that collective group look like as being good stewards in the scripture? We can go to Leviticus 22 and 9 where the priest serving in the tabernacle, and and, and, and and we can go to Acts uh, chapter 6, verses 1 through 6, where we see the seven chosen by the Jerusalem church, and, and we understand that this group here was the, what we consider to be the first group of what they call deacons at this position, as far as that they were chosen so that the apostles didn't have to neglect as far as the teaching and the praying and, and all of that that was going on, but we see this group here being good stewards, have a responsibility, take care of it. Remember Stephen, Thomas, he was martyred, Peter, Philip, the Ethiopian eunuch, he had the word in him, and he met him. He asked him, do you understand? How can I understand unless someone tells me? And Philip explains to him and ultimately baptizes the Ethiopian eunuch that was already on Good steward. Household steward. We've looked at individual examples. Group examples. We can talk about household. Uh, uh, in Genesis 43 and 16, uh, uh, when Joseph saw Benjamin 
uh, with them, he said to the steward of his house, Take these men to my house, slaughter an animal, and prepare a meal. They are to eat with me at noon. Seeing how, as individuals, we should do this, right? Adam, Genesis, Joseph, good steward. What do you have? Daniel. Even in exile, was still faithful to God and did things as God told him to do it. And he rose in stature there while in exile. Can we talk about Ruth, the collective group, people, that first group in Acts? How they serve. And then we go on. And even in the scriptures, we see Jesus talking about stewardship. And even with stewardship that Jesus talked about, Jesus uses parables. He uses the parable of the shrewd manager to emphasize accountability. A good steward has to be accountable. What does he have to be accountable to? For whom does he have to be accountable to? Who do we have to be accountable to? Who are we accountable to? Who? Yeah. Yeah. We have to be accountable. And, 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 and I don't want to read it. You can read it for yourself. The, uh, the parable of the shrewd manager of Luke, uh, chapter 16, verses, uh, one through, verses 1 through 12. But, uh, but, but, but I'm, I'm going to give you a synopsis of this. But in this parable, Jesus told this parable of the unjust manager to teach that his disciples must use their wealth for kingdom purpose. The application follows the, par- the parable. The, in the parable, a rich man called his manager to give an account of his dwellings. The rich man had heard that the manager was not handling his wealthy owner's finances wisely. In Jesus' day, managers were often hired by wealthy people to care for the finances of their estate. Such a manager would be comparable to a modern-day financial planner or trustee who controls the finances of an estate for the purpose of making more money for the estate. Uh, 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 the, the, the money did not belong to the manager, but was his to use for the estate. So that's a whole lot. Let's step back. I'll throw this out at you. How many people in here is going to continue to use a financial planner, advisor, if the only thing you're doing every every month you look up, your money is just sinking, going down, 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 and down? Who? Who? Say, it's a depression coming, but look, man, I just lost, I just lost two hundred dollars. Look, what, what what are you doing? Hey, I got to find somebody else who who who, who, who can do better. You're just not going to, you're just not going to sit there. And stay and continue to lose what you have, what you've been trusted. Because if it's each month, if you've just taken a, a big pot of money and said, hey, here's here's $250. I, 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 I need you to make it 500 or make it 750 And you look up and that 250 you gave me is only worth now $50. You're probably looking for a new financial advisor, right? A planner, right? And, 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 and so... We'll get to it. You probably see where I'm going uh, with this, but 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 there has to be uh, some accountability, and, and 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 we are entrusted to what? What has He entrusted us with? The gospel message, right? Are we supposed to just hold it and hide it and don't share it? Huh? We. We're supposed to go every way we go. It's like going, here it is. Hey, here it is. Hey, here it is. Hey, here it is. Hey, here it is. There you go. Hey, if you take it, okay. If you don't, hey, I've, I've done. Hey, here it is. Hey, here it is. But Jesus, in, 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 in this parable, in three ways, Jesus applied the parable to his disciples who had to live with non-believers in this world, talking about stewardship. He first he said, one should use money to win people into the kingdom. Jesus said, the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than they are with people of the light. Uh, 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 um, and, and the second application that he gets out of this parable is that in, in verses 10 through 12, if, if one is faithful in his use of money, 
then he can be trusted with greater things. True riches seems to refer to the kingdom spiritual riches of which the disciples will, will partake. In the third application that Jesus drew from this parable, that if you go back and read, is that Jesus drew from the parable was that a person cannot serve both God and, and money. First thing he talked about, one should use money to win people into the kingdom. How, how does one do that? A modern day question. Is he talking about buying somebody? Buying someone uh, salvation? Can you buy someone salvation? No. But how can you use your money to win someone to the kingdom? How? Well, I go to Quick Trip. I just use Quick Trip. I go to any store, and I'm not. I'm not recommending that if you're out at 12 o'clock at night or even during the day now to. Somebody just come up and you by yourself or here and there, but for me, is that well I'm hungry. Oh, okay. Well, let's go over here and get something to eat. But if I buy you something to eat, I got something else to put on your plate. What you do with it is what you do with it. But I'm going to share this news with you, which I think some people are struggling with. Quick trip, right? Because sometimes it's kind of hard to witness to someone if their fundamental needs are not being met. You know, whatever that may be, it could be food, it could be clothes. You're telling me about how great a God he is, and you're riding around in a Range Rover or whatever, and, and, and I got and, and I got a, 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 a hose coming out of my shoes, and it doesn't have to be the, 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 the biggest thing. My kids are asking me the last pair of shoes I bought was like damn near twelve and eighteen dollars. My son just looked at me and just shook his head. <laughs> you know, but fundamental needs. It's, it's kind of hard to witness to someone with fundamental needs. Can we can, can we do that? You know, hey, if I give you this, I'll, I'll share this. I'll share this with you. No different than if you're having a food drive out here to Deacon Walker, your head. If we give people food, say, hey, your fundamental needs being met. Let me share something with you, right? Huh? So, and uh, as I said, first thing here, one should use money to win people into the kingdom. Uh, the second application is if one is faithful in his in his use of money, then he can be trusted with greater things. True riches seems to refer to the kingdom spiritual riches of which the disciples will partake. And the third application uh, Jesus drew, and which I've already indicated, is, is that a person cannot serve both God and money. And we go on, and Jesus, uh, in scripture, he talked about how individuals, right, stewardship, what it looks like. We talked about group stewardship, what that looks like. Right, we talked about household, right? And we talked about Jesus talking about accountability and stewardship and as it is with how that accountability and stewardship, what that looks like. But also through the scriptures also talks about and shows the emphasis of each individual's responsibility when it comes to stewardship. Because we've been entrusted what God has given us. Because don't think that whatever you have just came up on kind of on yourself. Everything that you have, it says that every breath that you take, the hair on your head, the height, everything that you have, God has given you. God has given it to you. You don't have it because of you. You may have given you your ability to be able to get it. God possessed all of it. And in Luke twelve forty eight, it says, "But the one who does not, but the one who does not know and does his deeds to serve in punishment will be seen with approval. For from everyone." Who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, more will be asked. Much responsibility. Responsibility for accountability. And do we all have a responsibility with the gospel which the Lord has given us? Yes. It's not just Pastor Scott's job. Yes, we we have a salary. We pay. We we all shepherd what the Lord has given us to receive. But it's not all on his shoulders to do the things that need to be done in this church. Everybody who walks in here, if you claim to be a follower of Christ, God has entrusted you with this ministry. And it's incumbent upon us to go out and to share. Right? To be a light in the world. To draw glory. 
dog to be a good steward is is to be a good steward is an honorable thing. Go back to a financial planner. A good financial planner is what? Someone that's sought after, right? And hey, if someone told you that I can take five dollars and turn it into twenty five hundred, I won't go use that guy. And I'm not talking about David. Uh, but I won't use that guy as good as that 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 you're going to. I'm just, you know, uh, you know, I, not folks laugh with me, but hey, but if you if you can invest five dollars and get me twenty five hundred, I'm just saying that's probably the best thing you ever heard about. Yeah, you know, it's an honorable thing. You know, good good manners. I mean, Christians are not going to get there unless we get ready to go. Uh, you know, because like I said, I don't want to be too long. I understand that we just have long days. And for those that are home, probably still have things going too. Uh, but Christians are entrusted with the stewardship of the Lord. First Corinthians 4, verses 1 and 2. This then is how you ought to regard us as servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the mystery of God has revealed. Now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. The question I ask tonight, as we get ready and as we close, is why is there no proofs here? Are you faithful to what God has entrusted you to do? Because all of us can claim all of us have confessed that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. And we have been entrusted with trust. And I come here tonight to be trained and equipped with all things. Trust me, you will learn and you'll share and you'll grow. Amen? Let's take it all in this morning. Be most gracious, dear Heavenly Father, I come to you tonight, Lord, to just want to say thank you. Uh, Father, I, I, I pray that what was said here tonight from your father was was the received word uh, but I also pray Heavenly Father that if there was anything that was said that wasn't clear that I pray that you'll allow your spirit uh, to give them wisdom and understanding and take me out of all of the confusion Lord Lord I pray that you be with each and every last one of us as we go throughout the week I don't know the trial to the burden that each person may be dealing with right now tonight Heavenly Father but I ask that you meet each person where they're at and, Lord, again, we just pray uh, for our shepherd that you've given us here for this season. I pray that you continue to watch over your servant, Pastor Seth, that you be with him and keep the loving arms around him and his family, that uh, that you would just lift them up, Heavenly Father. And, Lord, I pray for each and every last person here tonight that hears my voice, um, that whatever trials or tribulations he may be going through, for those that need healing, I pray for healing. For those that need peace, I pray for peace. Uh, for those that need comfort, I pray for comfort. For those that need discernment, I pray for discernment. For those that need direction, I pray for direction. And for those, Heavenly Father, this week that this is dealing with right now, that it's just reassurance of whatever we're going through, I pray for that too. But I also pray too, Heavenly Father, that I, I pray that uh, any obstacle that has been set in our way, Heavenly Father, that has, has, has prohibited us from being faithful to you and sharing your word, word the lost word, I pray that those uh, obstacles be removed. I pray that you give us all a spirit of boldness uh, to be able to share your word uh, as we go throughout this week. Uh, here's the name of my blessed Lord and Savior, and all these things in the name of Jesus Christ.